So over the past 70 years, the Indo-Asia Pacific has been one of the world's great success stories. Completely transformed since the end of World War II, uh, the region is now home to the world's three largest economies and seven of the eight fastest growing markets. The Indo-Asia Pacific also has seven of the world's 10 largest armies, which means the area also shapes the course of global security. So I firmly believe that every nation who considers itself to be a responsible contributor to international security must work diplomatically and economically to bring Kim Jong-un to his senses and not to his knees. So while diplomacy is our preferred means of changing North Korea's course of action, it is diplomacy backed by credible military power. My job as a military commander is to develop those hard power options. Many people have talked about military options being unimaginable regarding North Korea. Folks, I must imagine the unimaginable. And what is unimaginable to me are North Korean nuclear tip missiles delivered in Los Angeles, in Honolulu, in Seoul, in Tokyo, in Sydney, in Singapore. So I'll continue to provide military options to President Trump and Secretary Mattis while doing everything possible to emphasize our desire for a peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. This includes calling on China to do more to exert its considerable economic influence to stop Pyongyang's unprecedented weapons testing. North Korea has only one ally, that's China and vice versa. Chinese entities are involved with roughly 90% of North Korean trade. That means Beijing has exponentially more influence on Pyongyang than anyone else, which makes China the key to a peaceful outcome on the Korean Peninsula. We also want Beijing to do more to stop provocative actions in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, where the Chinese are building up combat power and positional advantage in an attempt to assert de facto sovereignty over disputed maritime features where they are fundamentally altering the physical and political landscape by creating and militarizing man-made islands where they are using its military and economic power to erode the rules-based international order. Consider that earlier this year, China had an intelligence collection ship operating near Alaska in America's exclusive uh, economic zone. China was acting in accordance with international law, so no criticism there. Yet, I keep reading in the press that China continues to complain about U.S. lawful and peaceful freedom of navigation operations in international waters and about our flights in international airspace above them. Ladies and gentlemen, China can't have it both ways. In my opinion, Beijing's desire to pick and choose when it comes to international law speaks volumes about the kind of nation China is and will be in the decades ahead. So I've advocated for dealing with China realistically, as it is and not as we wish it would be. Just last month, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Joe Dunford, said during congressional testimony that China will pose the greatest threat to the United States by 2025. Yet General Dunford also recently visited China, where he signed an agreement with his Chinese military counterpart to enhance communications and decrease the possibility of miscalculation. That's dealing with China realistically. Today, Marawi is a wake-up call and a rallying cry for every nation in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Foreign fighters are passing their ideology, resources, and methods to local, homegrown, next-generation radicals. So we must stop ISIS at the front end and not at the back end when the threat can become even more dangerous. But we can't do it alone, only through multi national collaboration can we eradicate this, this nemesis to humanity before it spreads further in the region.